Welcome everyone to the April 24, 2023 special call meeting for the Cabarrus County Board of Education for a legal, legal services presentations. So we will move to 1.01 .01 and I will call this meeting to order. Board members will move to 2.01. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you everyone. Board members, we will move to 3.01 to adopt the agenda. I need a motion to adopt the pre uh, agenda as presented. So move. I have a motion and need a second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay and a second by Mr. Furr. All those in favor of adopting the agenda as presented say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you board members. The uh, agenda is adopted as presented. <coughs> We will move to 4.01, our Legal Review Committee Overview with our Superintendent, Dr. John Kapicki. Okay, uh, board members, in front of you, you should have a packet um, that I'm going to review with you this evening. It should take me about roughly five to ten minutes, depending on any questions you may have, okay? What I want to walk you through is our process and kind of give you a background, most of which you are up to speed on, but again, I want to review it publicly so that we can be very upfront about our process and what we did in terms of this uh, request for proposal that we just completed. So I'm going to go through the packet. The first thing you should see in there when you open it up, you'll see a legal services selection process that's dated May 3rd, 2021 and ends on June 14th, 2021. That is the last time that the Board of Education went through the request for proposal for attorneys for the Cabarrus County School System. And if you notice in there, roughly you're looking at about a month and give or take 10 or 11 days to do it, about a five to six week period that you proceeded through the last time and you can kind of see the timeline there from beginning where you discussed the contract and gave direction to staff to the posting of the legal services to the closing of the RFP to the documents that were given to the board by the committee of the board the committee that reviewed the RFP documents independently the interview selection by the review committee the interviews that were held those presentations and then when the board actually voted on the meeting now it ends there, it says June the 14th, 2021, um, but I think the board is well aware for those that were on the board at the time, the actual legal services contract for the current attorneys was not approved until the August 16th, 2021 meeting. And then there was a resolution that was also passed to pay them for the uh, July work that they had done. So they started work in July 1, but the actual contract did not get approved until August 16th. And there was a resolution that went through that the board about adopted and approved at that August 16th meeting as well. So I share that timeline with you because it gives you the wrap, the quick success, the quick process that was it went through. If you look at the next page, you can see the legal services selection process that we just went through. Put the timeline together much as you had seen in the past and I wanted to do that so you can kind of reference both sides. One of the things that this current board had directed me and had concerns of was the timeline that we were working under currently. So I want to show you the, the lengthy time period that we took this time around. We began on December 12th to discuss the contract. On January 9th, the board informed the current um, legal team that the contract would end enforcing the 120 day notice that ends on May 9th of 2023. And then the January 24th, current legal service vendors received no notification of that non-renewal. Um, and that was both given in, in, a, in a direct fashion, orally, and it was also given in a letter that was given to each attorney by me. February 13th, we start the new RFP process by the, the advertising, and that lasts until March the 17th. So you can see we took a five to six week process to advertise for new legal, for new legal firms to, uh, if they were interested in serving Cabarrus County, they could. 
those were received we posted them to the board uh, the five RFPs went to the board on March 26th for their review April 4th was the first meeting of the legal review committee that was put to put in place and we went over the process we were going to use to bring us to this evening and I'll go over that with you in a moment April 18th was the second meeting that that legal review committee had to review briefly the outcomes of the evaluations to make sure that we all understood what our responsibilities were and if there were any questions or if there were any anything that was left remaining that anyone had questions on in terms of how we evaluate and things of that nature and then you'll see the May 1st May 8th uh, timelines that we put on there they're on there for reference only that's up to the board to decide as to when and if they decide on appointing a new legal firm but just to give you reference points so as you can see um, not being negative to the previous process but we took our time this time we, we were very thorough we vetted it very well and we and we took our time going through the process so we had five RFPs that were received the legal services review committee was given two weeks to review and score each proposal each proposal was scored independently by each uh, person on the review committee um, did it on their own and I'll go through that process with you in a moment we provided them a scoring rubric based on the selection criteria that the RFP outlined and the two firms that were selected are here this evening and then the May 1st and May 9th contracts uh, information is in there for you to review the next sheet in your in your uh, packet is the uh, the May 4th 2021 <coughs> request for a proposal it is a one-page document um, that gives the information for firms that would like to bid on the services for legal uh, for to, to be the legal representation for the Cabarrus County school system back in May of 2021 then the next one you'll see is the current request for proposal um, it's, it's about eight pages in length it's four four pages back and forth it's, it's broken down by section it outlines it it's comparable to the other one I think that the current legal request for proposal legal services does a better job in defining what we're after and when you look at it um, background one we're looking part one is the background information you'll see letters a b c and d in there and e kind of detailing the work and what we're looking for part two is the instruction for submitting a proposal we outline that for the firm so they can have reference as to what we're looking for the submittal letter the description of the firm the description of their experience the team that they have working with them within their firms the fee schedule and we put an example in there much like the first proposal back in 2021 of some of the fee things that we were looking for in terms of what they would cost us whether it be the partner rate the associate rate and does it in and would that service be included in the retainer that's some miscellaneous things in there we asked for a billing statement we asked that the firm list any additional services that they provide that were not listed in the RFP in case we missed anything we wanted them to feel free to tell us what those services were provide any details of any litigation against their firm within the last five years we all wanted a copy of the firm's professional liability and certificate of insurance and we wanted them to disclose all regulatory agency disciplinary action taken on firm on the firm or its employees in the last 10 years and we asked them to review our policy 2610 which covers how we engage with attorneys for Cabarrus County part three we asked for the professional credentials I won't read them but they are listed A through H and what we sought after for the Cabarrus County school system and then part four is the selection criteria and what we at minimum required of the firms that uh, put, put proposals into place we then outlined an anticipated timeline we follow that timeline I would say to the letter with the exception of the last one we said that the selected firm would be notified April 17th and in fact that's why it says anticipate a timeline because things happen as you're going through this in terms of working through the proposals setting up meetings adhering to everyone's schedule and honoring the board's um, schedule as well so our second legal review committee meeting took place on April the 18th where we got all the scores and gathered them in and then that brings us to this evening Okay. I'm sorry yes ma'am is this information where the public can see it I think this is listed on the documents that are on board docs is that right you can get them put out there and the RFP was uh, 
posted obviously on the on the website of the school and it, it was public knowledge for everyone it's also it, so it's available if anyone needs this information I'm just asking if the what we're going over now can be shown on the sure. screens and available for the public to go through as we're going through it I can't do that mrs. Sanders because we don't have copies of that but I can definitely post this on the on the board docs after this evening so that the public feels they want to review it they can do so thank you yes ma'am Next in your um, packet is the Legal Review Committee's Evaluation Guide. Again, I'm not going to go over it in detail, but you can see these are the things that we asked our Evaluation Committee to adhere to. We put in a conflict, conflict of interest statement that all of our members of the committee signed, um, which is also a confidential agreement. We put some quick guide do's and don'ts in there. We put the evaluation process in there. And just general consensus things along with the evaluation rubric that we were requiring our committee to adhere to give them some general outline things that they should watch and and and, and follow as they score the the, uh, the firms <coughs> the next page in there you'll see the legal services review rubric and if you go back if you would engage indulge me please and go back to the to our request for proposal and look at section 4 selection criteria you will see that the selection criteria asks for background experience qualifications of their personnel presentations if, if requested and if they had done any references their billing cost hourly rates etc and then some of the preferences as indicated above in section one of the background experience that we expected the firm to be able to do so if you look at the rubric the first part of the rubric talks about professional qualification and credentials for 10 points the bulk of the score in the 50 points was for the professional background experience again not all inclusive but it covers a, a large portion of what our law firms are required to do and obviously that is the the meat of the scoring rubric if you flip it over you also see that there is a point score in there for references for costs on the fee schedules and then for presentation seminars for a total of 100 points so we match the metric to the selection criteria in the RFP and again we will post this for anyone to see The next sheet has a scoring of all nine members of the committee and how they ranked each firm and underneath that you'll see the first through fifth place votes and what the firms received so you can kind of do the breakdown yourself to see how they were ranked and how they were scored by each individual committee member and how we got to this evening and why those two firms were chosen I have a question mm-hmm what does NA mean under NA Campbell? means it was not available. Um, Campbell Shelley was a was a law firm that put in a request for proposal. It was more a letter of commitment that they were interested in certain parts of work for the district, our EC services, some human resources work, and some other things that they could do, but they could not become the general counsel or represent the district as a whole because they didn't have the capacity to do it but they express interest in some areas, not all. So appropriately, the committee, I think, scored them um, well because it was an incomplete proposal. But they were interested in serving our EC department and our HR department. I'm still a little lost. So NA under Sam Treadaway means that, that inf some information wasn't available because other folks have them scored. Um, maybe I'm reading some, this wrong. Some, some folks scored based on what they saw and other folks on the committee felt that there wasn't enough information available to score them completely. And I would okay. refer to Mr. Treadway and ask him if he would like to comment on that. Please do so. Yeah. Uh, to quote their entry, well, it'll take me a minute. It, it basically said I cannot you know uh, serve as your general counsel I can't remember the exact wording mm -hmm. so that's why I felt like it was you know I it, it was in a that's why I put uh, I did not score I guess that's the same for everybody else that did not score because they felt they could not okay thank you yes ma'am 
The last sheet there is a summation of the last 10 years, that what it has cost our district beginning in 2013 up until 2023 as of January 6th, what it has cost us in legal expenses for the Cabarrus County school system. On average, over the last 10, 11 years, it has cost us $468,936 dollars and 75 cents as of that date so that number may be a little skewed if I if I were to take in the last two months of um, legal expenses for the district wouldn't go up dramatically but it might not be exactly the number I gave you but on average over the last 10 11 years Cabarrus County Schools has spent four hundred sixty eight thousand nine hundred thirty six dollars and seventy five cents on legal expenses across the district and you can see each breakdown of the years from 2013 to 2023, current as of January 6, 2023. We felt that was important to give you an idea of, of what it's costing our district for our legal expenses and maybe pipe some questions into your, into your thought process as you hear the attorneys that are interviewing this evening and their cost structures. There are some suggested questions for reference for you. The committee, each member of the committee put together questions. I asked them to give me three or four questions from their various departments of representation that you could either use if you choose to or not, but it also might help you uh, formulate some questions you may have yourself. Um, the first set of questions is from our student services representation. The second set of questions is from our EC department. The third set comes from our construction department. You'll see the HR questions next. You'll see that the next set comes from our deputy superintendent, and then the last section comes from our finance department. They are just for your personal reference should you choose to use them. You are not obligated to. We just felt we'd give you a little bit of information to, to case, in case you were kind of thinking along those lines. It might help you form a question. And then the last two pieces in there are the representations of the firms that are here tonight, Johnston, Allison, and Hoard, and Porner, Spruill. Their, their proposals are there for you to reference should you need so. That is the entirety of the, of the background work that we did. Um, I feel as though the committee has done a really good thorough job and brought to you the two firms as you see how they scored and the process that we used. Uh, we were very open and transparent about this and I feel as though that everyone that served on this committee, in particular Mrs. Escobar, Mr. Fur, Mr. Treadwood did a really good job representing the board and, and making sure that we stuck to the process that uh, I have just revealed to you and, and kind of explained to you. So if you have any questions, I'll engage and I'll answer them. If not, we're going to bring the first firm firm in for you to hear from and present to you this evening. Any Are other there questions? Any questions? Mr. Walker? Uh, what instructions have you given these firms as far as what they're presenting to us? Great question. I've told each firm that they have 30 minutes to present to the Board of Education and upon the end of their presentation the board would engage in them in a Q&A said roughly to be 30 minutes I said but we're not going to hold you to that timeline it may go longer that's up to the birds purview and in respect to whatever the board would like at that end uh, we budgeted about an hour and 15 minutes for each firm um, to come in and, and, and give their presentation have your Q&A but again that's up to the board's purview as to what they see fit I have two questions um, first question is uh, in relation to uh, policy, I think you said 2210. Um, were there any identified or any noted even thereafter, any conflicts of interest with anyone that might have been serving on uh, this committee that was designed to review to the my, firms? To my knowledge, uh, based on the conversations I've had with the committee, the committee did not indicate to me any conflict of interest. The committee sits behind me and in front of me if there's anybody in this room that feels though there's a conflict of interest or there was any part of a breach to that, you can feel free to speak. So things, what I'm asking you has been brought to my attention in the community and I just want to ask these questions so that we're mm -hmm. able to answer them and folks that. and answer, answer and answer folks questions. Sorry. The other question um, that I have was in relation to the reviews of uh, firms. Are those reviews or the committee meetings when those firms present, are those open to the public? And the reason I ask is in 2021, um, there was a firm that sat here at the dais in every single um, review 
meeting that I attended with those attorneys in 2021. And I was told that was because those meetings are open to the public. I'm not sure, Keisha, I understand your question. Okay. I hope I'm explaining this right. When I said in the, I was on the committee in 2021 yeah. that reviewed the attorneys that came in or that answered to the RFP and every single one of those review com, the committee review meetings that I sat in there was an attorney one of those attorneys that was interviewing that sat at the dais and listened to every single interview of other attorneys so the reason why that attorney was able to sit here and listen to the other interviews was because i was told that the meetings those meetings were public yeah. i hope that made sense i i, I i'm going to try and answer it. i think i understand if i'm not clear on this just clarify for me we as a committee decided and in our second meeting when we discussed it to not interview the firms we felt that was the board's responsibility and we bring them to you tonight to present and you interview the firms because it ultimately is the board's responsibility to choose the law firm for, that represents the Cabrera County school system. So again, I'm going to defer to uh, Mrs. Escobar, Mr. Treadway, Mr. Furr. Um, I believe in, in the committee itself as a whole that's here this evening, our thought process, and we did discuss it at the April 18th meeting about interviewing them, but we felt that that was not something that we were going to do, that that was the board's responsibility. Uh, Mrs. Escobar, Mr. Treadway? I just want to circle back and 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 there was a strict code of confidentiality mm -hmm. within that room in, in, during our meetings. And so uh, uh, I, I didn't feel like anyone from outside that room needed to be a part of that conversation. So uh, uh, I can't speak for, you know, years ago, but uh, it was, it was uh, very much an internal conversation, the two meetings we had. Yeah, and I would just add, we did not speak with any of the law firms. Anything that we did was based on the proposals that they submitted and, and rating from the rubric. Uh, so we, we discussed the importance of bringing the firms forward um, to, to speak now. So this is the only time that anyone has spoken will speak to the law firms that are coming forward. Right. Um, and then I think we've asked the law firms to not sit in for the other, correct? Yeah, we did, none of our lawyers sat in the committee. It would just be a giant conflict of interest because they represent us right now. There were no lawyers in the room when we spoke as a committee, no. And that was my point two years ago. There was a firm that sat in on the interviews from the other firms, and I was told it was because those meetings are open to the public. I don't think that I'm, I'm making sense in for you guys and what I'm saying. There was a lawyer that sat back, one of the groups that was responded to the RFP in 2021, sat in every single interview of the other attorneys that were interviewing for our board attorney RFP that we put out. This meeting is televised, right? So they can sit there and watch. I don't know if I'm not talking about this meeting. I'm talking about the, the interviews. One. I don't remember the other one being televised. I'm talking about the interviews we did not interview them, though. We did not interview the lead. The, the, farm, the firms that are coming to you tonight, we did not interview. That, we felt that, it, we felt that that's your years. job. Yeah. I, I wasn't I'm, part of that committee, so I, don't, I do not. I'm talking about two years ago. Two years ago, ago. got it. D Denise, were you? I think I remember what you're talking about when we did the interviews as a committee. Mm -hmm. They sat back mm -hmm. here. Correct. I do remember that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Sandage. And, and again, I have the confidentiality agreements that we all signed. Then the last thing I want to point out to you, to be very clear, I did not vote on this committee. I only led the committee and followed the directive of the board. I don't think it would be very objective for me to participate in the scoring of these firms since I've worked with two of the firms that, that put proposals in. It would not be fair if I were to try and rank the firms across the board, knowing that I've worked with two of the firms that put RPs in. So my role in this was to lead the committee through and just explain the process and the procedure we were going to use and they did that very well but i'll be very clear on that so there's no misinterpretation that um, i scored any of the firms i did not and i did not talk to anyone about scoring or how they scored they did that independently and individually on their own so i hope that wasn't what i was insinuating no i know that i just I, wanted to clarify no. from the responses that i've gotten all weekend about a special call meeting today in relation to firms i wanted to make sure we were able to answer those questions publicly 
Yeah, and I'm not and I'm not stating that, Ms. Sandage, um, because of what you asked. I just want to be very clear and very transparent. I know how important that is to our board. I want to be very clear as to what my role was. And my role was to work our committee through the process, explain the process to them, and be the guidepost for the committee, but not to participate in any of the scoring. I, too, wanted to just ask a question. There were, um, who all did the reference checks? Like I did the reference checks, um, and I, both of the two firms this evening um, had uh, very good references from all the ones that they listed. Three of the four references for Johnson, Allison, Horde, and Middlebrook's Law, I did check on. The fourth, I did not get a response back on, so three of the four I did talk to, and I shared that with the committee on April the 18th. The Pointer Sproul, um, I checked rough, I talked to six, four superintendents, two board members of the listed references that they, that they have listed. There might have been 10 to 12 that they listed. I was able to contact six of them. Both firms that are being presented to you tonight came with glowing recommendations. Um, we asked uh, five things, responsiveness, knowledge, staff, staff interactions and relationships, and uh, experience and length of service with the with the firm the, the people that they worked with and all the responses that i received on both firms were positive uh, there were no negative comments they were very positive and, and i shared that reference check with the committee at the april 18th meeting and in the legal review guide it says the superintendent will check the references any other questions board members okay thank okay. you thank you Give me a minute, we'll bring in our first firm to present to the board. So board members, we're gonna move to 4.02, the legal firm presentations. Uh, the first presentation will be Johnston Allison Board Attorneys and Middlebrooks Law, PLLC. Good evening. Good evening. William, uh, thank you for coming this evening. We welcome you and we, we appreciate you coming in to present um, your presentations even to our board. Um, as we explained to you, um, we're, I kind of gave you the ground rules and what we, our expectations are, but um, we don't want to press you. I mean, we want you to take the time that, that this deserves. It's a very important decision for us. And if you'd like to, when, when you're prepared to, you can introduce the members of your firm that are with you this evening. So sure. I'm going to hand it over to you, and thank you very much for being here this evening. All right. Well, thank you. Um, on behalf of Johnson, Allison, Horde, and also the Middlebrooks Law Team, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, th I will go first on behalf of my firm, and then I will introduce Pat Kelly, a partner at my law firm, Johnson, Allison, Horde, then Grace Catron, associate at our firm, and then Gil Middlebrooks of Middlebrooks Law. Um, so as you guys know, my name's William Eisenhower. Um, I'm a partner at Johnson, Allison, Horde, and Charlotte. I know a few of you folks, but, but not all of you. Um, over my 19 years of practice, I've appeared before uh, many boards and had the chance to participate in a number of these presentations. But tonight is different for me. Th this is truly a personal thing. I'm the son of a retired Cabarrus County Schools teacher who spent 39 years in Cabarrus County Schools teaching thousands of kids. I'm also the product of Cabarrus County Schools. I'm a proud graduate of Beverly Hills Elementary, Concord Middle, and Concord High School. 
And now I'm even the prouder father of two Cabarrus County School students. My son Thomas is a sixth grader at Winkler Middle School, and my son James is a fourth grader at Weddington Hills Elementary. My wife Elizabeth, herself the product of North Carolina Public Schools, is also now the president of the PTO at Weddington Hills and the secretary of the PTO at Winkler. So it really is a family affair for us. Cabarrus County Schools has been a huge part of my life for 45 years. Faith in and commitment to our school system is a deeply personal thing for me. I also know what it's like to serve on boards. Being the former chair of the City of Concord Planning and Zoning Commission and the current chair of the City of Concord Historic Preservation Commission. If you can believe it, uh, serving on that Historic Preservation Commission can almost be as controversial sometimes as serving on this Board of Education. In addition to those commissions, I currently serve on the boards for the Boys and Girls Club of Cabarrus County and also the Cabarrus Chamber, as well as a number of other local nonprofits. As a partner in a Charlotte law firm and as a long-term resident of Cabarrus County, I think I'm in a unique position as someone who understands Cabarrus County but can bring to bear the sophistication and specialization of a larger Charlotte firm that has been around over 100 years. Currently, my firm and I serve as general counsel for existing Cabarrus County clients, including the Water and Sewer Authority of Cabarrus County and the Cabarrus Health Alliance. In those roles, I attend board meetings serving as board counsel and then work regularly between meetings with staff leadership. I understand the balancing act of representing and reporting to a board while also taking assignments from staff. At JH, we see ourselves as not only attorneys, but we want to be thought of as trusted advisors and true partners with the sheer goal of protecting the students while protecting this board, this leadership team, and CCS staff. In addition to our Cabarrus County clients, including WASAC, Cabarrus Health Alliance, the Boys and Girls Club of Cabarrus County, Cabarrus Country Club, and many others, my firm and I have served as general counsel for Central Piedmont Community College for many years. I have also represented Novant Health and Charlotte Eye, Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates and other health-related clients for many years, and I've led my firm's relationship with those clients. My personal practice includes, but is not limited to, local government, board governance matters, general contract law, and real estate. I would also like to introduce you to some of the other JH members who are here with me this evening. Pat Kelly is the chair of our Employment Practices and Benefits Group. Pat is a graduate of West Point and UNC Law, like me, and has practiced at JH for more than 30 years. Pat and I work together on a number of clients, including Cabarrus Health Alliance, Novant, Senta, and others. He will come forward in a minute to share more about his practice. Grace Catron is an associate in our litigation, employment practices, and benefits and construction groups. Grace is a graduate of the University of North Carolina in Wake Forest Law. Grace will sit, assist Pat and Gill with HR, student discipline, and other matters. Grace will also come forward and share more about herself and her practice in a few minutes. In addition to the folks from JH here tonight, we have a full team standing behind us with specialties in all civil practice areas, including litigation, construction, real estate, condemnation, and personnel HR. At this time, I would like to ask Pat to come forward and introduce himself. Good evening, everyone. I'm Patrick Kelly. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear us out. I am the head of our law firm's employment practices group. We've got about eight or ten lawyers who are in that area. I would anticipate if we um, get this arrangement worked out that I would have a team of three or four employment attorneys who would be on call responsive to this board's needs. Uh, and that pro probably be me as the senior partner a junior partner and a couple of associates that are specialized and ready to st step in and help uh, however they can. We handle virtually any sort of employment matter that may come up soup to nuts. Um, I am a chambers rated uh, employment attorney um, and literally whether it's litigation, whether it's counseling, whether it's employment contracts and disciplinary issues, 
anything that may arise with this with this board and this uh, we can handle that uh, for example right now I represent the Mecklenburg County uh, EMS agency as one of my clients and have been representing them for 25 years as their outside general counsel and in that capacity I do all their employment work but in addition any other types of issues that come up we handle uh, that happens to be a joint venture between Mecklenburg County Atrium Health and Novant Health and so we work together with all those boards and handle all sorts of issues that may come up um, we really appreciate the chance to to be here today one thing you will get from us is we're responsive and we're competent and we're pragmatic we know that our clients need an answer and they don't need a lecture so if they need an answer to their problem we try to be problem solvers get you the answers you need so that you can do your jobs and what we see as our success is the lawyers is keeping you out of trouble keeping you out of the courtroom and if we've done that we've done our jobs and if we can't always control the outcome on everything but if you do get in trouble in one form or another we can help you with that so that's really all I have to say other than we're here to help uh, we have extensive experience if you looked at our um, our bios and resumes and we look forward to the opportunity to serve you if anyone has any questions of me I'm happy to answer I think we're going to wait we have other people that are going to also present Yes, we'll probably right. wait to the end if that's okay. That works. That's okay, great. thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to call Grace forward. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. It is truly an honor to be here. Um, I am from the Charlotte area. As William mentioned, I went to Chapel Hill and Wake. So Carolina runs deep in my blood, too. Um, and my both my mother and then my, te my sister are teachers. My sister graduates in a few weeks and is about to start. And so this cause is very near and very dear to my heart. So truly, I'm just excited to be here on this awesome team of people. Uh, I'm learning from the best. And so I'm truly excited just to be here to serve y'all in any way I can and to take whatever work they will pass my way as an associate. Um, and I also think it's fun to note that Gil Middlebrooks was my professor in law school. He taught me federal courts, so hopefully he has good things to say about me as well. Um, but thank you guys, truly, for having us today. All right, in addition to the JH team, here with us tonight is Gil Middlebrooks. Gil is truly the education law expert in the Charlotte region. He has 40 years of experience as an education lawyer, including serving as general counsel for the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education. At this time, I would like to turn our presentation over to Gil. Thanks, William. First, I wanna uh, thank you for your vote of confidence in our, in our team. To this point in this process I know it's a, a lot of work for you as a board um, I know that uh, you're roughly two years into your current legal team so I know that this is a period of uncertainty in that regard our goal is to bring certainty to you in in the provision of your legal <coughs> services I think it's significant that you heard from Grace just now not just because she said I was her professor but rather than just our old guys you need to understand that we are as a team collectively committed to pushing the work down to the level where it can be done the most efficiently. Now on many things that's going to mean that you're going to see me or you're going to see William or Pat or somebody like us but where we can we're going to push that work down to associates because um, that's going to be more cost effective for you. In my time before we get to questions I want to talk a bit about my experience and a bit about our proposal and some particulars in that. I am a trial lawyer who spends a fair amount of time trying cases but more time working with clients to either resolve disputes or better still to prevent those disputes from happening in the first place. Like William this is personal to me but in a different way. I live in Charlotte. I got into education law in 1985 when my daughter Nikki was born. Nikki has an IQ of 57, which means that she's moderately developmentally disabled, and she spent her entire career, educational career, at Charlotte's Metro School, which is the public separate school 
for students with significant um, intellectual disabilities. I've lived the parent side of special education for 38 years and will continue to live it every single day. So I know firsthand how the decisions are made from the parents side, but I also know from a practitioner side that those decisions and how we educate those kids have an impact that far outlives their time in school. And the same is true for um, regular education students. Now, in special education, as well as all education matters, I limit my practice to the school side only. I do not cross that boundary. I'm only on the school side. My experience is not limited to special education. Everything that, that Pat and William and Grace talked about, I've done personally, and I've done many times. Every one of us probably remembers where we were on 9-11 when we heard the news about the Twin Towers and what happened in Pennsylvania and at the Pentagon. I remember that I was on the phone in my office that morning talking to an uh, insurance surety bond lawyer about construction delays at what be later became Philip O'Berry Technical High School. I've negotiated contracts with superintendent clients, uh, um, uh, candidates, and other um, board officials. I've handled the backside of those relationships when, when Superintendent A was leaving and Superintendent B was coming. I've handled teacher dismissals, student disciplinary hearings, Title IX matters, and a lot of special education matters. I've helped in redistricting, three big redistricting projects in, at CMS when I was there. Earlier today, my wife and I received an email from our homeowners association about redistricting where we live. So I know on an ongoing basis how fraught that process is. And when you're in a growth community like Cabarrus County, you're going to be dealing with that. And I've been there and can help you through it. For 15 years, I served as lead outside counsel for CMS. And for seven of those years, I sat in the board attorney chair at board meetings. I litigated all different kinds of cases, and as we noted in our proposal, um, I helped to establish the case law in North Carolina that defined and expanded the scope of a public school board's governmental immunity in situations where it has liability insurance that includes a deductible. I've worked with other districts, Union County, <coughs> Cumberland County, Randolph County, Buncombe County. I was the lead consultant several years ago in studying the pros and cons of whether the Shelby City, Kings Mountain, and Cleveland County schools should be merged into one integrated district. In addition to K-12 clients, I've worked on Title IX matters with Davidson, and, and before William got the gig, I represented CPCC for a number of years when Tony Zeiss was the president, and when they changed presidents, they changed law firms. William got the job at that point. I've taught special education law as a professor at UNCC. I've taught general ed law in the Wingate um, doctoral program. And as Grace hinted, I currently am an adjunct professor at Wake Forest Law School where I teach a course called Federal Courts, which has very little to do with education law, but I also teach education law there. Um, before I turn to our proposal, I want to give you one more specific experience that I've had with these folks. I mentioned my daughter Nikki. She lives in a group home now in the Charlotte area, and I'm on the board of the nonprofit that runs the, her group home and 19 others. We had a falling out with our CEO. I needed somebody to negotiate a severance package that made sense and was sensitive to our needs. We called Pat Kelly. He did a great job. Um, and that, that experience tells me that we have the right people on this team. Enough about experience. Let me talk to you about our proposal, some specifics in our proposal. Our plan is that I'll serve as primary board counsel. I'll be the one coming to board meetings. Um, to the extent um, you want me to, I'll come to other board committee meetings. Um, we don't think it's appropriate to send two lawyers to normal meetings. But if, for instance, let's say I'm there as general counsel to the board and we need a closed session to talk about an employment case that's being litigated, 
then whoever's handling that case from Johnson and Allison is going to come too. But otherwise, we'll just have one person, primarily me. When I'm not here, you'll see William. He and I will coordinate all work that is given from the board or the staff to us collectively. Most of it, by definition, is going to go to Johnson, Allison, and Horde because of their bench strength and experience. But what I bring is the overall guidance and experience because, as I say, I've done these things that they do on a daily basis as well. We expect a fair amount of cross-fertilization. For example, if you have a student disciplinary appeal that comes to the board, you're going to see me probably as um, procedural counsel to the board, and you'll probably see Grace Ketron or another associate there as presenting the superintendent's side. We'll make those kinds of judgments as we go. It could be me presenting on behalf of the superintendent and Grace sitting as procedural counsel. Immediately, once, once we start, we're going to want to sit down with Dr. Kopecki and his cabinet staff, whoever he thinks is appropriate, to determine what the protocol is for getting assignments. <coughs> And when I've worked with other school boards and, and larger districts, sometimes there was a problem where even a high school teacher thought he or she could call me up and get me to start working on a legal problem. That doesn't work well for me and it doesn't work well for the district. So we'll want a protocol so that we understand what vetting process Dr. Kopicki wants to go through before a matter comes to us. As we undertake the transition from current counsel to us, William and I will work with the two firms that you're using now to, and with Dr. Kopecki to review the status of all current matters. There may be some matters that are so close to the finish line that it doesn't make sense for us to step in, either substantively, economically, or both. Those will be game time decisions and we will be talking to you and to Dr. Kopecki and the staff about that. The work that we do to review and transition the work from your current counsel will be handled under the retainer. You will not get charged separately for that. And I think this is, is clear in our proposal, but I want to say it again, is that we will not charge travel time or mileage to meetings here or to, to, the, to any school in Cabarrus County. We're just not charging any travel time or mileage for anything that we do in our engagement. A few words about training because I think this is a very important part in schools. For years, I've presented nationally on general ed topics and special ed topics, things like how to deal with angry parent syndrome. Another one that I've done that nationally all over the country because I get asked to repeat it is a seminar called Dealing with Doctors, Lawyers, and Other Creatures of the Night. <laughs> you get a catchy title and you back it up with substance, the crowd is going to come. I've presented multiple times to the North Carolina School Boards Association, its affiliate attorney group, all, all kinds of districts and clients. I'm currently working on a presentation, refining a presentation right now on the explosion in, in anxiety among our students, especially when coupled with a demand from a parent that you must immediately start homebound instruction. What do we do to get those kids back? We know statistically that every single day that a student is out of school, it makes it doubly unlikely that the child will return. Earlier this afternoon, a client asked me to do a comprehensive 504 training as part of a resolution agreement with the Office for Civil Rights. So here's where we stand with our training proposal, collectively between the two firms. We will train as much as you want for no additional charge. As much as you want us to do. Little bitty star asterisk, we need to build some reasonability in there. But in my experience, I've never had clients take me up on all the training that I offered to do. We want to talk with Dr. Kapiki and Cabinet to establish a schedule so that y'all can plan, we can plan. We want to explore whether we should do some async, I can't even say that word, whether we want to tape some things and put them in the can so that your staffs can look at them on demand. That has a great deal of ease. The problem is things change very quickly, primarily because the North Carolina General Assembly is in session, and education law changes very quickly when they're in session. And in addition to updates that we'll provide at the meetings, 
board meetings, we're happy to do board governance training whenever is convenient for you. William's done it, I've done it, we'll combine and put together something that is tailored to what you want to do. In, in, in closing, let me say this before we get to questions. The other folks that you're talking to, great lawyers. I've known Brian Shaw for almost exactly 30 years and a lot of the lawyers who are now part of the Pointer firm. Whichever proposal you select of those two, us or them, you're going to be making a solid decision, no doubt about it. We think, though, that being local is a plus factor in our favor. The ties that William Eisenhower and others have to this community cannot be d um, diminished in any way. They're, they are very important. People in this room before um, we left with Ms. Props told, told me that they had been taught by William's mom and that they had had a great impact. She had had a great impact on them. That's where William comes from. We believe our combination of local knowledge, community involvement, experience, and expertise should bring us across the finish line. And although Zoom and other video platforms have been a godsend for businesses in the pandemic era, there is absolutely no substitute for continued face-to-face -face interaction to build and maintain the relationships that we want to do. I share what William said about becoming a trusted advisor. That's a mantra for, for we lawyers. When you move beyond just being a transactional lawyer to somebody the client comes to see as a resource that they can call about anything. I get tons of calls where I don't know the answer. But I say to my client, I will find that answer for you or I will find somebody who can answer it. And I want them to be calling me because they know that they will get good guidance. I often speak with my educational clients about what uh, the lawyer's role is, especially in disputes that the school is having or the system's having with somebody. And I explained that the role of any good lawyer is to get a win for the client. But that doesn't mean pummeling the other side. What's important in that is that we work together to define what a win is. Because at the end of that equation is usually a student. And what we do as educators and as lawyers has an impact on educational outcomes for that student. So it's, it, it's crucial for us to speak and to speak a lot about what outcomes we want. And so I work with my educational clients to stress the importance of procedures. In special ed, for example, it's all about procedures. If you follow the procedures faithfully, you should make a defensible decision. I talk to them about answering questions, about what Walt Whitman said about being curious, not judgmental about asking the question in disciplinary um, situations, is there a teachable moment here, or are we beyond that in this situation? By doing that, we lay the groundwork for better decision maker by the educators, and thus cutting your legal spend significantly. Those conversations and the trainings that I do to help educators become better versions of themselves are the most fun that I have on a daily basis. Caveat, except being in the courtroom. I love being in the courtroom. But you don't get there every day. But, but having those talks, helping them get better, helping them to understand why the rules are as they are, and understanding how to use those rules to get where you need to be is great. So thanks for listening to me, and thanks for this opportunity. I'm going to ask William to come back up here, and he and I will answer questions. OK, board members. Ms. Escobar. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, thank you for what you just said about recognizing that the other side of this is a family, is our students. Uh, that's very important to me that we recognize that um, whatever is coming before us it affects a child. And so we want to do right by all of our students. Um, I want to talk about EC, uh, and I'm going to read one of these questions. 
As the attorney supporting EC, you will be notified immediately by the EC director or superintendent when a petition for a contested case hearing is received. Describe the level of support you will provide to support the district with next steps, including your approach to collecting information from the district and your approach to mediation, settlement, and preparation for potential trial. So as you may know, the first step once you get a contested case position is the school has to hold a resolution meeting or at least offer a resolution meeting to the parents. In my experience these days, most attorneys reject that in favor of state facilitated mediation. So the first step we have to do is we have to file these forms. And we'll have to establish a protocol with, with your EC department about who's going to do what in that. Because many of my clients want me to go do the forms. It's easier for them. Um, that's not true in bigger districts where you have the manpower to get it done. That's the first step. So the second step is usually mediation. What I like to do before mediation is assess the case. Have we made a mistake? If we made a mistake that has impacted the child's education, then we need to start figuring out what we're going to do about it. Let me put it in car accident terms. If we caused a car accident that, ca that caused $1,500 of damage, and that's the only issue in the case, property damage, and the other side comes in and says, I want $5 million, we got a bit of an issue. They come back and say, okay, I want $2,000, we're close, we're talking. So sometimes, and, and this is especially true with some of the parent side attorneys, they can overstate what they're really entitled to. They want 40 hours of compensatory ed when we missed at most five days of speech and OT. So I look at, I help the districts that I work with um, gather those documents. I, the first thing I will ask for, in addition to the contested case condition, let's assume I don't, need, I don't know anything about the case. I want the, the current IEP, I want the current prior written notice, I want the goal progress reports, and I want the current evaluation pack. From those documents, I usually can tell what we're dealing with. Because especially in the prior written notice, I can tell, has the district communicated what it's doing and what it's not doing? And in the goal progress reports, I can tell pretty much, sometimes I have to dig deeper, how big a problem we have on data collection. I hope, hope that answers that. That does. I guess the other follow-up question that I would have for you is uh, responsiveness time. Today, um, I, I'm, I'm in charge of the interns, and so we met with the safety uh, team today. And what struck me about that is that um, you can't predict when a crisis is going to happen and whether it's the superintendent or it is the EC director or another uh, member of our staff they're going to they're going to need help at awful hours i mean it can happen things can happen threats come in yes not during the school day yes. so how easy is it to get to you um and not an associate when it comes to something at that le I, I understand that you're going to push and I appreciate that too efficiency matters but when it's important and they need you um, they can't wait no you're great ask any of our client references Williams and mine too they will tell you we're very responsive for my side of the house for we're, we're going to establish a protocol with Dr. Kapicki and his cabinet for what kind of matter do you call whom so so very quickly we're going to get to the point where if you've got an emergency HR matter you're calling Pat Kelly you're not going through Gil but if you've got a student matter EC or otherwise you're calling me and you'll have my cell phone number I get I get calls all the time I will get three at least three calls on the ride home because I, they they want that responsiveness and that's we're here to give it to you the sandage We can do that. Okay. Miss Lindsay. All right. So appreciate very much um, what you've said already tonight. So thank you, um, all of you, for, for coming and presenting to us. Very impressed with what you've presented to us already. Um, got a couple of questions for you. First one being, what is your knowledge of Robert's rules? I'll go first. You go first. <laughs> there was a guy named Robert. He had some rules. <laughs> so, so here, here, here's what I'll tell you. W one of the first things I do with new boards is I talk to them and say, let's talk about parliamentarian procedure. Because as you know, if your lawyer 
one of the things your lawyer sometimes will try to do is to hide and not make a decision that ruffles your feathers in favor of Mr. Treadway because we need to be honest brokers to everybody. In situations where boards have attorneys as parliamentarians, the chair obviously gets to override any decision and you can vote overturn the chair. But Roberts has a rule has a set of rules for small groups, not the big 200 people processes. And those rules are based primarily on fundamental fairness so that a board member or member of a small group has his day or her day to be heard on a particular issue. That's how I approach it. And and could if you quiz me on every part of the ins and outs right now, I'd say, I'll let me go get my cheat sheet. That's what I'd say. You do this. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, you know, I attend monthly board meetings for, for Wasac, Bear South Alliance, and, and others. And, um, yeah, I mean, we, we try to, to follow the rules, but, uh, you, it, you know, there, there has to be some flexibility to it as well. And then every board is different. I mean, they, they truly are. They have different personalities, and each chair is different. And so we would want to also see what, what's worked in the past for you guys, what hasn't. Um, and then as far as the formality of Robert's rules, you know, we obviously abide by those, but even there, there is always some subjectivity that, um, an interpretation, um, you know, to, that we can kind of help you navigate. And, uh, you know, we would envision that we would be, uh, up there on, with you guys, you know, navigating that, um, one of the two of us will be at every one of your meetings. Thank you. Um, now I think, um, Pam definitely hinted on this. Um, EC is a huge um, concern of ours. Um, we have made very large strides in the right direction, um, I feel like, but want to continue that. So that, that's a big fear of mine is for us to make sure that our EC department continues to move into the right direction. So um, some of the things as far as previously in the last two years, I know that um, with Ms. Fitzwater, they've sat down, had conversations um, with the EC staff to understand what some of their struggles are, what we can do to help with that. Do you see yourself also doing that and sitting down with the staff so that you can bring that information to us? Um, yeah, uh, yes. Um, I will need to see what they think their problems are and where they have room for growth. And, and I will need to assess that as well. Because on some of this stuff, there are different ways to get to the same place. I mean, the obligation is free, appropriate public education. You can get there an infinite number of ways. But documentation is harder. So, for example, I look at data collection. I want to know how well a job our people in the schools are doing on data collection. So if they win the lottery, the next person can come behind them and pick up in stride. I've had situations where schools didn't do that and people walked off with the data books, leaving us in a world of hurt. That can happen in a system this big. We have to have structured ways so that people sitting in this building can check on what's happening at a high school 20 minutes away from here. So yes, I'll sit down and we'll have that discussion about what are your most emergent needs right now? What are your long-term needs? How can training impact that? Do we need to go in and do some audits, kind of like the state does? Randomly pick an IEP file, see where we stand. So I, I've, I do that all the time. Okay, good, good. So my last question for right now, what is angry parent syndrome? <laughs> it is the situation where you have a parent who is upset at something they think the school is doing or not doing. And that can be at different levels. You, I think you didn't do right by my child in his IEP, or you didn't deliver the services that you said you were gonna deliver, or you discriminated against my kid in a disciplinary situation. You gave William two days because he's from Cabarrus County. You gave Middlebrooks five days because he's from South Park. That might be valid, but you know, you, that's, somebody's gonna be mad about that all the way up to berserko crazy people who have their own sets of issues that we need to realize that they have their own sets of issues that have nothing to do with what we're doing at the school. So what I work with educators to do, and board members quite frankly, is to recognize where people are coming from. You know, 
we went to a consumer mentality and a distrust of authority starting roughly with the vietnam war and so when you look at the proliferation of school choices when i grew up in the atlanta area you could go to the public school you could go to the catholic school that was it you got charters you got all kinds of private schools so there's choice so they look at you like a buffet that they can pick and choose and it's only going to get more like that with the changes coming with the general assembly so what i work on there with with schools is first let's figure out why the parents angry if they've got a legitimate beef we need to address it if they don't have a legitimate beef we need to work on communication strategies and and we do that thank you i appreciate it yeah, thanks for the presentation i thought it was uh very informative I answered a lot of my questions that I had written down here already so uh, thank you for that uh, I guess I'll change gears a little bit um, as a school system we do an awful lot of construction we have some buildings that need to get built during a certain period of time and on budget because there's only a certain amount of money that we have um, can you go over a little bit about how you work with the construction uh, especially these contracts like the AIA, AIA standard agreements or do you work more with customized documents to better protect school school sure. systems so yeah I can speak towards that uh, Johnson House and Ward actually has one of if not the largest construction law practices in Charlotte um, that's the one thing that we're really known for is we, we have a lot of folks and they do it both ways I mean there's some that are just AIA there's some that are specialized contracts um, but we love to get in on the early stage and actually be able to get a chance to review those contracts and we often our, our best case is if we get to negotiate those on our clients behalf sometimes we inherit them and then that's where the construction litigation comes in down the road so we handle a lot of that but ideally if we can get on the front end we can try to help minimize the conflict on the back end um, but we have a team of uh, 10 to 12 folks um, that, that do that sort of thing every day um, and uh, we would definitely would have someone who would be designated um, to kind of be the liaison for you guys is and then they part would have of the retainer a is that, not, not, that's, that's that, that would not be part of the retainer you know those kind of con conversations um, obviously Gil has some background in there you know we could if there's if it's a, a one-off question you just have a, a generalized question then yes I mean I think you pick up the phone and call Gil if you're wanting a, a contract reviewed or something like that then I think that's a different conversation in my experience this is like working with parents communication is key we need to be in, on the front end of your contract negotiations because your GCs and others will amend the AIA form. So you're thinking you're dealing with the form and you're dealing with an amended form. And the second thing I will tell you is it is hugely important that somebody in this district for every construction project, somebody employed by this district wakes up every morning and says, my job is dependent on getting this done on budget and on time and has personal professional ownership of that because that's where it goes south the thing I talked about on 9-11 the, the school system failed to have a, a confident project manager and that the HVAC and sheet metal work got all, all whoppy jawed so that communication is hugely important at the beginning and throughout the project thank you Mr. Farr. Yes, uh, thanks for your presentation and uh, thank you for complimenting the other folks, the other firms, because uh, going through this process, when we was doing evaluation, I was like, darn, they're both pretty close. <laughs> I mean, we They could, deserve we, the compliment. Yeah, they're we very could, good. We could go, we, we won't go wrong with either one of you. Right. And you was thorough on your presentation because I had questions about uh, uh, training, I had questions about uh, the uh, travel time charges, so y'all answered quite a bit so in the redistricting I had wrote down so you got experience and all that but I'm gonna I'm a read you a question that okay. was presented so what's your experience with working with title nine claims and what experience do you have in providing training so district level leaders and school leaders around the title nine compliance I've done a ton of title nine investigations I've, <coughs> I've done training the new regs are about to come out. If they come out the way we think they're going to come out and conflate, combine, whatever term you want to use, the investigator and decision maker process, and, and you don't have to have two different people, assuming that's the way you want to go, there's going to be more training that needs to be done on an ongoing basis. So we're, I'm happy to work, work with the right people in your district yeah. in the cabinet on that. 
Thank you. And also, too, I was thinking, you know, when you were talking about providing the training, you know, with COVID, what it did to us, there's a lot, of, especially new employees that probably haven't had, I know like athletics, a lot of our new coaches that have some of the training that they need because we just couldn't do it. So uh, it was good to, the way you answered the question. And also, I like the way you said wing it instead of wing gate. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Sandy. I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> so thank you, as some of my other colleagues have suggested, uh, for the presentation and for responding to the RFP and then coming in the top um, of your class, if you will. Um, so I appreciate your experience and I also appreciate the history that you have here in Cabarrus County. Um, there is no understatement there. That is kudos to you and your mom and your parents. I appreciate that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the questions that I have heard in the community with respect to a law firm choosing a law firm and then also just um, piggyback on some of the experiences that I have experienced as a board member with previous firms so bear sure. with me sounds good um, so who in your opinion is your customer who are you working for the board thank you um, can so I say, can I say one thing mm -hmm. the board is our client 99.9% .9 of our work is going to flow through the superintendent oh you answered my question from okay. saying so, just so that. If you, look, if you look on an org chart, the way I look at it, you got the board and you got the, the superintendent right down from the board, and off to the side is board attorney at the board level but separate. But you answered my question okay. when you said that, so thank you. Um, do you two have a memorandum of agreement? Um, if, should you get this contract, do you guys have a memorandum of agreement that talks about your relationship as two separate entities? So I, I can answer that and then Gil can weigh in as well. We, we don't have a formal memorandum of agreement. Um, Gil has, like he shared, he, he has known our firm for, for many years and knows a lot of folks, uh, family connections and work relationships. And so we, we have a good understanding. We've already divvied up in our minds. And then also on our sheet where we, in our proposal where we talk about um, different people who would do different things. It shows what Gil would do, what I would do. Um, obviously, if, if you guys were so inclined, you know, we could memorialize that if you wanted more specifics. We would present to you guys it, like certain situations, that's Gil. Certain situations, that's William. Certain situations, that's Pat. And we would provide that to the board so that you guys would know, and Dr. Kapicki as well, to know who that person is. I, I can tell you in my experience doing this and representing other um, large organizations is sometimes it is good to have one point of contact or, or two points of contact um, it, it, rather than you going in a million different directions but I, I understand that you would want to know who, who that person is and and obviously also to you know I can be cognizant of the fact you, you don't want us to be billing for something Gil's billing so we, we would work all that out between the two of us and when you saw our bill you would know that what's been divvied up the retainer that gets paid, that would be just something that Gil and my firm would work out together. Um, you know, it, it would, we wouldn't bother you with the details of how that got broken up between the two firms. Well, one other thing I'll say is that um, William and I are going to meet on a regular basis. It may get to weekly to do a full case review so that I know. For, so, for example, if the HR head has called up Pat and opened up a matter, William's going to tell me about it so that when I show up at the next board meeting, I know what the heck's going on. And, and if I open up five EC files, I'll talk to William about that. From a trial lawyer standpoint, where I view, start and think in my head, we're covered by what's known as the joint counsel privilege. So that will be shared between the, the firms. There's no privilege issue if I tell William what's going on in one of our cases. And I can just to add on just for our firm specifically, I, I think one thing that we do a good job about is that there's not a, a, a competition among folks in my office. We will get you to where you need to be, who's the best fit for that work. And I, I kind of see myself as kind of the relationship manager for some of our other clients. And we'll have clients like a Novi Health might have 40 matters with us. You know, uh, uh, WASAC maybe has 10 or 15 matters. Uh, Central Piedmont may have 15 to 20. And so I kind of know a little bit about every one of those matters. And then I'm not necessarily doing the work on that matter. We're getting you to the specialist. If it's a construction contract, you're talking to a construction litigator. You know, if it's an HR matter, you're getting to Pat. So I, I kind of see my 
role as kind of the gatekeeper to get you to the right people. Um, so I'll have to have a little bit of knowledge of everything going on. And, and Gil will be a lot of that the same way. I mean, he, he has to be the gatekeeper. He, he is a one-man firm, so he, he's the gatekeeper. But I envision that we will be talking, if not every week, um, maybe even daily. Does that answer your question about the MOU? Because that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It, it's good enough. Okay. Um, I was getting somewhere specific, but your responses were good enough. Sure, and, and we like understand. It. Well, I mean, and, and I'd be better than good enough. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, and I can understand that. You, also, I, I know where two firms. You, I think we will be a united front there. I, I can tell you that we, we will work things out between Gil and me before, before we would come to you. So um, I, I have no qualms that we're not going to be able to work well together. He's he's worked with our firm over the years and good relationship. So you guys are good together and <laughs> we'll understand who's doing what as yes. a board. Yes. Okay. yes, we'll be very transparent on that. Thank you. Um, so can you help me understand how you will notify this board of litigation, like the time frame it will take, you know, updating us on where you are in the process, where the case is, um, suggestions that you may have for us. I'm really looking for a time frame. I, I want you to help us set that. Um, you know that under the open meetings laws in North Carolina, um, it is permissible to go into closed session under a three uh, of that particular section 143 3 18.11 a3 but you have to name the case so I'm I am more than happy anytime you want to hear an update to give it to you that's part of the reason we're going to be talking and updating ourselves and if the board tells us that collectively this is what these are the points at which we do definitely want to be notified we'll, we'll build that build that schedule to fit your information needs Okay. And then the other question I had was, um, you said you're, well not said, you're from Cabarrus County and I just want to ask a question specific to possible conflicts of interest with anyone on this board. Um, no, I'm not aware of any conflicts of interest. Okay. And then I had a question about, you, you talked earlier about uh, picking up where the other firm left off. Can you help me understand what that looks like? Sure. Let's use your example of litigation. If trial is on, on May 15th you, and we can't get the case continued, we'll have to have a serious con conversation about who's going to do that trial because it's probably not in your interest to have somebody parachute in that close to trial. If the case was recently filed, and, a, and it's a special ed case and it just got filed or the schedule is pers pushable that's one where we can slide in pretty easily so it will be matter specific on the litigation front you may have and, and I don't know this but you may have litigation that is covered under insurance and you may have counsel selected by your insurance company and one of the things that I do under the retainer in those instances, if you want us to moni help monitor what that insurance counsel is doing, we, I, we do that as well. Sometimes boards will say, no, we want you to have a more active role. So we, we'll look at every dispute matter that you have to, to make an a initial determination, okay, we need to talk to somebody about whether we step in right now or not and get a decision at either Dr. Kapicki's level or the board level, whatever you're comfortable with. But the rest of the stuff, contract negotiations 99.9% .9 of it I, I think we can step in pretty seamlessly yeah and we, we've gone through that process before I, I've gone through it four or five times myself I mean and lawyers as much as we've liked to go paperless we still have our paper files so there, there's a lot of even traveling to the law firm and picking up bankers boxes and and, and I've done it it's a little awkward sometimes going to the former firm but um, I'm sure they would you know, work with together with us and just to pick up those files and have a transition and have conversation yeah. there, there will be there will need to be conversation between your current counsel and us yeah I like um, I like Jonathan his office is a thousand yards diagonally away from mine in South Park so that's pretty easy and the reason for my question, and you may not ha be able to answer this, maybe Dr. Kapiki may need to answer this, is I'm trying to identify potential costs associated with um, paying for your law firm and then paying for the counsel that we currently have because it's, we're not able to address whatever litigation may be in front of you because of the time frame. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, is that something that will come back to this board so we understand the costs associated with I hope I'm making sense y'all. 
Yeah. Okay. Good. You are. Yes, you are. Um, currently, right now, to my knowledge, there are two cases. One is scheduled for trial early May. One is scheduled for trial early June. But there are steps prior to trial. They may not even go to trial that we can get um, any attorney firms that the board appoints up to speed pretty quick. Um, so we, we would have that conversation and can take care of that. But we would know if there's some possibility of us having to pay the okay thank you i would i would update the board as soon as the board decides on what firm we're going to use moving forward i will update the board with the with the attorneys that you choose present to update us to where we are in current litigation my last question is a fun one so can you help me and the public and this board understand your communication styles well i, I would say right off the bat and uh, i think gail talked about the responsiveness you know there there are other attorneys who can do what we do. We, we just share with you, and we, the Pointer and Spruill folks can do it. I, I think what sets attorneys apart is responsiveness and, and then temperament and, and, and personality and how, how well you get along with them. And I can say, I, I think if I have one special skill, it would be the responsiveness that I, I'm going to get back to you. We're going to get you to the right place. And my knowledge of Gil is that, that he does that same thing. Um, so I, I think that the style is I am available by cell phone, email, text, office line. Um, I, I'm very rarely unreachable. I mean, I, when I go on vacation, I'm doing emails and texts to my wife's sugar in. Um, so um, it, there's... Uh, we will be accessible. I mean, that, that is something. And then the benefit of the firm and the benefit of working with Gil, um, th there will always be somebody available, literally, at, you know, maybe not between midnight and 5 a.m., but other than that. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll say this. Back in the day, before cell phones were widely available, I got a pager when I started working for CMS. No cell phones. And you know that was back. And when cell phones first come out, you couldn't get signals in the hospital, so everybody wore a pager. And I, my mantra was, there are two people that whose page I will answer immediately. One is the superintendent of CMS, my biggest client at that point. And the other one is my wife. That superintendent's long gone. My wife is still with me. So that's that's a good thing for communication style. You guys will have my cell phone number. The, Dr. Kapicki will have it. The, he, he will tell us whose calls we need to answer immediately. And then if we get some other call that sounds like an emergency, we're going to answer it. Clients text me, email me till 10 o'clock at night. Sometimes they need an answer right then. Sometimes it's something that can wait because they're doing it as, con as a convenience. Some boards are, are different in their communication styles and, and within boards. Some board members are high information need people. And, and I want to have that individual conversation with you guys. It's important for us to be honest brokers of information to every single board member so that what you hear is what you hear kind of thing. And, and that it's not, not unreasonably delayed. So if I'm communicating with a board member, you know that Ms. Adcock at least and Dr. Kapicki are going to know about that immediately. And then I'm going to take advice from Ms. Adcock about how, where we go with that communication thread there. So we'll start probably by over communicating with you and have you tell us to shut up a little bit. Thank you. Mr. Treadaway. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate the comments you made about winning and losing and recognizing that while we may be the clients, our clients are the kids. And that's what's got to be in the front uh, of, of all of our thinking. I appreciate that. Uh, I've got three little not not even scenarios but uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, for example if we go into closed session and we're talking about a potential exposure for litigation when you're addressing the board what do you see as your role you said earlier that one of your goals is to keep us out of court I think there needs to be a more nuanced it, boilerplate keeps us out of court but we need more than that I think so sure. help me help me with what you think is the lawyers role in talking with the board so that we can make good decisions about exposure especially you mentioned the scenario of closed session so let me start there the the first role of the lawyer is to make certain that the reason you went into closed session is capturing what you're discussing in closed session so that if you go in to talk about a particular case and you pivot to the superintendent's evaluation 
then i then i have to raise my hand and say you're outside the scope of your motion we need to go back out open go back in and do it right in any situation where where a lawyer is talking to you guys in your corporate entity form as the board it's important that one we're an honest broker to all parties um, everybody has a slightly different political agenda regardless of what label you have conservative liberal democrat republican that doesn't matter to me my job is to tell miss adcock the same thing that i'm going to tell you that i'm going to tell her and to, and to make it timely so the f number one is that that communication number two is to be honest enough to say i need to get more information because the question you're asking is a great question but i don't have enough information yet so you have to have the courage and the fortitude to maybe disappoint your client a little bit up front in order to get them a better answer in the long run but third when you're there and, and you have the information you present it to the board and you say this is the information that i've got let's talk about my advice if you're ready for that because there may be times where we will give you legal advice that where the legal advice is not clear the answer is not always you have to do this you have different options and, and we will work with you through that decision tree to say, here are the good options, here are the not so good options, here's what happens if you do these things. And then you get to make a business decision. What is your experience or, and it's circling back, what is the lawyer's uh, role in freedom of information request? If you ask us to get involved in, in FOIA and FERPA request, we will advise you on what the standards are and what the, both the, the North Carolina public records law requires for student records, for employee records, and what FERPA requires for student records. And then to some extent, you'll have some HIPAA stuff too. So I advise districts all the time. You typically have a 45-day response time under FERPA. Um, we're getting in especially in special education case Ms. Swar probably can tell me if I'm right about this but we're getting more and more requests of every single email every single text message ever sent about a kid and the problem there is you got to redact for the other kids names so I, I do tons of work in that area helping out now some districts have people who are perfectly happy not to call the lawyers on that so if you need our help we've got that expertise yeah, and we, and we can obviously weigh in on the front end if we think it's a valid request and what needs to be produced. But if you do need the manpower, we do do that for clients, especially clients that don't have the staff or the manpower to do it themselves. And so we, we will have times where you've had to review 9,000 emails um, to just pour through them. So we have that capacity if, if needed. And then lastly, uh, we're getting ready to enter that uh, twilight zone of redistricting you said you've had some experience with that can you tell me what the lawyers role has been your experience with that process sure first let me get let me talk about the trusted advisors well because that's where I want to get and that's where I think in this instance the lawyer can have most impact because typically in my experience the school is looking here versus here and there's not a legal difference between the two usually but where the lawyer can come in is provide an, an interested outsider's view of what's going on without the political overlay, don't have to stand for re-election, all that kind of stuff. And, and we can help say, have you considered what happens if you do this? What happens if you do that? That's where I think we bring the most to bear. Now there are times, and, and this happened while we were in the middle of um, the end of the Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg litigation in the late 90s, where the school system was looking at things that would violate court orders and we had to say no we gotta stop thank you thank you great questions I do have a couple of questions I wanted to ask you as well so have these two law firms worked together before is this the first time we have worked together before yes okay and it's in a school environment education no environment. not an education environment um, and, and that's honestly a big part of why Gil's here today he, he does provide the educational law experience um, I, I've had some experience not um, representing a school district um, representing community colleges um, representing um, private schools and, and that sort of thing but Gil really brings to bear the, the education law expertise yeah the, the public k-12 okay and then um, are your cost is there any negotiation with that or is that pretty much what 
you say is what you get. Um, I mean, we're, we're happy to discuss the, the, the setup and how that works. Um, uh, you know, that just, we'd be welcome to any kind of uh, conversations you guys might have on that, on how you would like to, to do the retainer. We've seen in the past, sometimes you've had a larger retainer, um, and then that encompasses more things. Um, here, we did the smaller retainer, and then that was really covering the, the board attendance and the training and things of that sort. And then that way, we're a little more transparent on our bills on everything else. So you will see, I mean, we bill in tenth of an hour increments. And so you would see a narrative and, and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, there is room to talk about that sort of things. I, I can tell you just as far as the hourly rates, that, that those are a steep discount from what we would charge our typical client. Um, our partners range anywhere from 375 to 575 or 600. And so our rate in our proposal was $300. And our associates have a, a range as well. So that, that, that we are coming off that. And we've done that for other governmental clients as well, where we've offered them a discounted rate. And, and we obviously always, with our clients, are, try to be as cost efficient as we can. Um, I think that is one benefit of our law firm, um, sometimes as opposed to a, um, some bigger law firms. Um, our law firm's 50 attorneys. So for Charlotte, that's kind of medium size. Obviously, this big for Cabarrus County. Um, but it gives us some flexibility where we don't have to charge sometimes the higher end rates. And like we said before, we will try to get you to the most cost-effective person, if that's an associate, if that's a paralegal. Um, there's sometimes a partner needs to be involved. And sometimes, because of our experience, we can do it quicker. And it actually results in savings that way, as opposed to an associate that might take more time. Um, but I can tell you, I mean, if you've got a chance to talk to our other clients, that we, we take the cost seriously. Um, it, it, whenever I've sent out a bill, and, um, and the way we would do bills is, you know, there's never going to be a bill that comes out of JH that I haven't personally reviewed and, and had the chance to review and ask the folks and mark up if needed. Um, so we, we do take the cost um, very importantly. Thank you. Um, the last question is on our school board agendas every time that we meet we have attorney comments if you were to come in here tonight and you were the attorney and you were going to give us comments what hot topics do you think you would present to us on education that are currently in the law if I was going to talk right this second mm -hmm. if you've not heard about the Perez case in special education that opens up the ADA 504 door if, if you haven't already heard about that I talk about that I talk about the passage of the transgender bill stuff athletics um, I would talk about the current status of the charter school choice stuff because that impacts you. Um, those would be the three hot topics. Part of it, I, I will tell you, I want to know what you guys are interested in because the boards that I've served on, they didn't let us talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that they all viewed that as a good thing. But, <laughs> but you don't want to be here at 645 and have me end at 730 kind of thing. But. But so I need guidance for that. But we'll we'll hit whatever you want because we you know we track that all the time. Yeah, in my experience, that that's kind of a unique um, thing on your agenda. I mean, that that's not the other boards that I attend don't don't have just a standing um, thing for the attorney comment. That said, though, I mean. Uh, you guys meet every month, but th sometimes there would be emails and whatnot. We would communicate something. If it was pressing that came out between yeah. board meetings, we would get it to you like that. Um, obviously, if there's something hot button, we would bring it up at the meeting, but that, that's a little bit of a quirk like where we don't usually see that. We're more responsive usually. It. Yeah, I love it. I, I, would love to, <laughs> I would love for you to keep it and, and say, Gil, you got five minutes on a hot topic. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Hit me with a laser beam if, if I go over five minutes. I'm Sounds cool good. That. Any other questions from anybody? Pam, Ms. Escobar? Yeah, I just want to make sure our staff, um, some of their questions come through, and this one popped up. Uh, oftentimes, teachers or student services personnel are subpoenaed to court to testify in child abuse or neglect cases and highly contentious custody cases. Please talk about your experience providing legal guidance to staff in these cases and how your firm would handle these subpoenas when served to CCS staff. The, the first thing that I do is I see has it actually been served appropriately within the meaning of Rule 45 of the North Carolina Rules of Civil Procedure. 90% of the subpoenas that my clients get are not served properly. They're just mailed by some lawyer. And you can ignore those. Now, I, I value communication, so I will say to somebody, 
you didn't serve this properly, let's talk about what you really need so that you're not disrupting the lives of our teachers. I have fought motions at certain times, certain times where there's disputes, they're asking for records. You can't just hand over records to somebody who is not the parent without their consent. So sometimes we have to seal those records and deliver to th them to the court ourselves. Every situation is a little bit differently, a uh, different. But wh what I find out, I, I look at the technical legal part of it, then I talk to the right person, whether it's the principal, assistant superintendent, whoever the right person is, and find out how much of a disruption this is and how much we should fight it if we need to fight it. And then if a person needs support, and representation the district wants to do that then there have been times when i've been with that person to help them out yeah and that that, that comes up in the healthcare world as well so pat has experience with that as well because there's sometimes you could just call the other side and find out what they really need and it's not that they need that person to appear they're looking for information and things of that sort so we can evaluate that but that honestly the majority of the time the person ultimately does not need to go because you can provide the information they needed some other way yeah, in a way that doesn't violate HIPAA or FERPA. Right. Ms. Sandage. My colleague has made a good point about the questions that we received from staff, and I just didn't know if there was an opportunity to get some of those questions answered since they may be pressing to staff about how you will handle different situations because it's literally a little packet of information. So clearly they've got questions too. We're, we're happy to answer whatever y'all would like us to do. I love talking about this stuff. And, and obviously, too, if you guys have any questions after this board meeting, um, feel free to reach out. Obviously, you, you've got our email addresses, phone numbers, contact information. We're happy to ad address any questions you know, subsequent to this meeting that you might think of. Okay. I think that we're done. Thank you so for thank the opportunity. You for the I will tell you that we've discussed this. We're ready to go. You vote tonight. I don't think that's what you're doing, <laughs> but, but we have a plan. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Great you all very much. Thank you. We're going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll do the next firm.
Okay, everyone, we're going back into session. Welcome back to the April 24th, 2022 Board uh, Cabarrus Board of Education special call meeting. We will move on to firm number two. Dr. Kapiki, would you like to introduce them? Oh, never mind. I'm sorry, I'm not there. Apologize. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Adcock. Our second firm this evening is, as we kind of outlined in the initial presentation when we began this uh, this, this evening, is Porner Sproul, and the representation from Porner Sproul that is going to present to you this evening is Brandon McPherson. Brandon, welcome. Uh, we've had kind of told Brandon the same thing we told Johnson, Allison, and Howard the what the ground rules were and what the board's process would be. So, Brandon, you may begin, and welcome. Absolutely. Good evening, board. It is good to see you. Uh, happy to be before you tonight. Uh, before I get too far down the road, I'm going to introduce two of my colleagues who are here with me. I've got Rebecca Williams and Katie Cornetto. Um, I will start by complimenting uh, Johnson, Allison, and Horde and say they are an excellent firm. Uh, you'll be well served by either firm. I'm now going to tell you for the rest of the time uh, how and why my firm is your better choice, frankly. Uh, I want to be your board attorney. I'm going to start out that out front. I want to work for you. Um, Pointer Sproul is a different experience um, than what you've been offered here earlier tonight. I will say uh, we are a 100 attorney firm. We have offices in Charlotte, Raleigh, Rocky Mount, and Southern Pines. The education group is 11 attorneys strong with access to the litigation, employment, construction, any number of other specialties, intellectual property, um, data security, any number of elements inside of this firm. But you have access um, to all of them. Um, Pointer Sproul as an entity has been around for over 100 years and we are excited to have the opportunity to work for this board and for this school district. While some of the faces uh, may be very familiar to this board, I will tell you that Pointer Sproul is a different animal than anything you've worked with in the past. We work harder, longer hours, and we do it better and we are working for multiple school districts right now um, and doing an exceptional job. The only reason I can say that is because I am confident uh, when Dr. Kapicki uh, contacted our clients, the only thing he heard was glowing reviews because that's all there is to say. We are responsive, we work hard, we get the job done. That is who we are. That does not mean we are perfect. We strive every day to do our absolute best for our clients and to do it in a cost-effective manner, knowing that our North Star is always the best interest of children. We will always put that first and foremost. At the end of the day, we get into conflicts with parents, employees, former employees, members of the public over any number of things. That does not mean that at the core of what we do is not the public service that each and every one of you has signed up to be a part of. Same for us. We are a uh, member of the body we serve at the body's pleasure and we will do our best every single day in the best interest of the Cabarrus County Schools. I would like to invite Katie Cornetto to come up and tell you a little bit more about our experience. I just shut off the microphone. It's now on. Hi, I'm Katie Cornetto, and I am happy to be here with you all. Um, in a former life, I was the um, board attorney for the State Board of Education and worked very closely with that board and the superintendent of public instruction. And during that experience, I realized just how important the work of the local board is. It transcends what happens at the state, I can assure you. I started out in 2017 representing local boards of education and what I came to realize very quickly, and this was even before COVID, is that what is the pressure that is put upon you gets absorbed by your staff. And just a word about responsiveness. Our folks who work with us are not just responsive, 
they consider it an honor when your staff reaches out because your staff and you as board members need answers quickly. We have five former teachers out of the 11 education law attorneys who work um, with our education section. Um, and our education group is also a part of a larger section that's government, land use, and education. Um, we started with the firm in 2021 and right in the midst of COVID and the recovery of COVID. And what we learned is that it got even harder for the elected officials to function. Um, one of the most important thing for any board is its human resources and our firm is no different. Our human resources make us who we are. And I'm very proud to say that we do have 11 attorneys, some of whom are former public school teachers. Also, one is a doctor of psychology, which we call uh, the secret weapon in our exceptional children cases because she understands the protocols and EC law, and it, it definitely benefits our clients. We also have Eddie Spees, who is a 50-year practitioner of law and education law. He formerly served um, for the State Department of uh, Justice. And Laura Crumpler, who was the head of the education section in the Department of Justice and worked as our, as she says, outhouse counsel <laughs> while I was the in-house counsel in the State Board office. Um, we are uh, very grateful for the opportunity to talk with you all tonight. We know that you don't take these decisions light, lightly, nor should you. But we also want you to know that the people who work at Pointer Spruill are the people who will stand beside you when the media is there. We'll stand beside you in a courtroom. We'll stand beside you when you have to make difficult decisions about resources and approaches to litigation, staving off litigation, and everything we can possibly do to teach you and your staff how not to have litigation. We're trying to work ourselves out of a job. And I do say that sincerely. Training and education is very important to all of us. And we feel like if we give you the tools and empower you and your staff, the less you call us, the better off you are. But you need to have the knowledge to be able to be effective in the way that you want to serve the children. In addition to our people, and you can see in front of you in our proposal, the folks that we have in the education group, we also have access, as Brandon said, to litigation attorneys, employment law attorneys, we also work with construction deals. We also work together with our financial services to assist on financial issues. One of the things I wanted to point out is to bring up my colleague, Rebecca Williams, who has the benefit of um, being a, a bilingual teacher, actually. She can probably address this board in Spanish, but I won't make her do that. <laughs> Um, but she wants to tell you about how she empowers clients to not need us. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, I am one of the former educators. I used to be a Spanish teacher um, in a former life. Um, but I think what you would expect from an education law firm or section like we are and a former educator is our approach to interacting with our clients is education. Our goal, kind of like Katie said, is to work ourselves out of a job. We want to teach your people how to do their jobs more efficiently, more effectively, and not get you into legal trouble. Um, so as an example, I'm going to tell you one of the sections that I specialize in is Title IX. Um, the way that I approach educating my clients on that, and if anybody knows anything about Title IX, I'm sure you all do. Um, it's a very highly regulated field. We're having a lot more plaintiffs' attorneys come in. It's, we're seeing a lot more action in this area. Um, the way that I approach that with my clients is, first of all, training, of course. What's different about our trainings is our trainings are targeted, practical advice. They're not these kind of 
billowy, legalistic, legalese terms. We want to give your people practical advice of how they can stay out of trouble, how they can comply with the law. After those trainings, what we have is a whole bunch of resources. Because we work with so many districts, I have the opportunity to develop these resources. Some client in District A needs something, now that's in my arsenal, and I'm happy to share it with your people. So we have template letters, forms, flow charts that we not just hand over to your people, but we sit with them either remotely, we can do it with Zoom, we can do it on the phone, or we can do it in person and walk them through how to use this template letter, how to use this investigation report, how do you conduct an investigation? And we walk them through it. And then what we ask them is, your first time doing it, send it to us. Let me get you a perfect go-by, a perfect example that you can take back and every time now use it. And a lot of times they're good after the first try, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they need us to look over things a little more, a little more hand-holding. We hand-hold until they get it right. But with the ultimate goal of that person being able to spread their wings and fly, just like we want all our students to do, we want all our clients to do. Um, but always knowing that if they have trouble, call us. Um, we are immediately responsive most of the time. Um, that's the benefit of having 11 education attorneys at your beck and call. Um, if somebody is calling for me with a Title IX issue and I'm busy with something else, we have another Title IX expert in the office. If somebody is calling with a special ed issue and your one person contact is busy, we can always slide somebody else in and we communicate constantly because we're in the same firm we know exactly what's going on with each other so the co we, we say it's the codependent practice of law at least that's what Katie calls it because we're always talking we're always communicating we know what's going on um, so that's just a little bit of how our approach is um, and that translates from the EC department to HR um, like I said title nine um, any of the other personnel issues that you have that's kind of how we approach everything and that's all I want to tell you Thank you. Board, I will not going to take up too much more of your time. I'm going to open it up for questions, but I'll say one more thing in, in closing of our presentation. We do excellent work for our clients. We represent schools day in and day out. It's what we do. We are happy to do it for you and any other school district in the state of North Carolina. We would be happy to serve you. But with that, I would like to bring in my colleagues and we'll start questions. Okay. I'm going to start with Mr. Treadaway at this end this time. So who is the ombudsman or contact Dr. Kopicki needs to call your firm? Who is the one that they will be talking to? That would be me. And you're the gatekeeper that decides where it goes from there. I am the gatekeeper. Okay. Um, I know one of, one of the goals that we have is to stay out of court, uh, but it, it's, it's easy to be too conservative and, and, and sometimes uh, make poor decisions based on that. When talking about exposure to litigation or, or whatever, uh, what, is the, what, is, what in your eyes is the, is the role of the attorney in talking to the clients being the board of uh, before making decisions. Okay. Very clearly, my obligation is to provide you your options as a board for making whatever decision it is that you need to make. I present you a variety of options. And that decision has to be informed. You have to understand the pros and cons of each of those options and have a working understanding of what the positives and or negatives are, both the consequences and the positives. Additionally, uh, my obligation is to make sure that if there are any obvious pitfalls of making that decision going forward, you need to understand that as well. But you need to make fully informed decisions, understanding the both consequences and opportunities that each decision you make provides. Anything? Sure. Um, as Brandon said, he would be what we call your relationship attorney. He's the guy you call at midnight or 6 a.m. as the case may be. Um, we all have that benefit of being instantly accessible. Um, but I think what 
Brandon is also trying to tell you all is that you can reach him anytime, but the work that needs to be done will get done by our group. So just to be clear. Thank you. Um, what is your experience with freedom of information request and what is the proper attorney role in that? Um, so having been involved with both um, several um, public records requests in the state of North Carolina, it's public records request um, almost you know weekly. Um, it, it depends on what the district's role wants the attorney's role to be. Um, there are several public records requests that don't require an attorney's hand at all, frankly speaking. Most of what you do is um, public record. The only determination that we typically make is whether or not something is confidential or not. And in most of those settings, frankly speaking, if we can train someone to redact, um, we would prefer to do that because that's going to save you lots of time and money. And all we simply do is review those redactions to make sure that something wasn't missed. For example, if the blacking out wasn't blacked out enough and you can still read what's on the blackout, that has happened on more than one occasion. Um, you know, it's, it, is, it is the role that the district wants us to have in those public information requests or uh, more appropriately, the, the public records request in the state of North Carolina. And so we handle those in whatever method and by whatever means that the district wants us to. In some instances, the districts will do the initial review. In some instances, they say, hey, we don't have the staff, the time, or the resources to review documents. Please do this for us and get it to us by X date. We do that too. Because public records requests are a whole lot like discovery, and we do a lot of discovery. So, anything else? Okay, thank you. Okay, one last question for me. Um, we're uh, just entering uh, a time of system-wide redistricting. Uh, what's your experience with that? And again, what's the role of the attorney, board attorney, in that process? Well, um, I redistricting, I've worked on redistricting and been representing school districts when they've been sued by redistricting, including Union County Public Schools when they were sued over their redistricting. So um, it, oddly enough, was also related to a public records lawsuit. Um, it's funny how those two went hand in hand. Um, but in short, um, the role of the attorney is to be an advisor and a counselor. To whatever extent you want me involved, I am not a MAPS expert. I am not a, I'm, will be the first one to tell you and so will the rest of my team. We are not uh, demographers. You hire those people for their expertise. If you want me to look at a situation and do a pro-con list, I can probably do that. But honestly speaking, you're going to be a better seat to tell me what the pro-con list is for redistricting than I am. I can tell you whether or not I think there are any legally problematic districts. But frankly speaking, um, my, my role is generally to continue to be the board's counsel and to be there for advice and to answer legal questions as they are asked. Thank you. Yes, sir. Tim is bothering me over here. He likes to do that. Um, so being an attorney group for several districts can be a gift and a curse, in my opinion. That's just one board member speaking. Um, how, how do you guys navigate with so many? I know you've got 100 attorneys, but, you know, my bigger question is how do you serve Cabarrus County? Because in my opinion, that's the most important entity of those that you list. So how do you do that and ensure that we get what we need from your firm? The same way I would do it for any other client, your needs and your uh, what is expected of my firm goes on um, an expectations list, the things I have to get done in any given week that our team has to get done, that our firm has to get done for you. And the expectation is they get done in a timely manner and within the time constraints that are provided. So um, that is honestly the great thing about the firm is that if I need to bring in somebody off of the bench from another section to do work, I can do that. And so that is the joy. Uh, because I will tell you on more than one occasions, we bring in folks who are experts in employment law to handle employment law cases so I can focus on something else for the Cabarrus County Schools that requires an education lawyer's hands. Mm -hmm. Not everything requires an education lawyer's hands. That's the great thing about being at a large firm. 
there are lots of things that are actually better served by having commercial real estate attorney hands working on something. For example, commercial real estate closing. You don't want me anywhere close to that, frankly speaking. I can read the documents, I can understand it, but the guy who you're gonna want is someone who actually does commercial real estate for a living. So I look at that and I say, yeah, your needs are the primary responsibility of the point of contact and the entire education group. We put it and do it very, very well. The expectation is to do our best, and that's what you expect. And the piggyback on piggyback on that, uh, you guys are in Raleigh. You have an office in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Will that office be servicing us and limiting like travel fees from you traveling to Raleigh here? How does that work? If 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 there are attorneys in Charlotte who are here to serve you, yes, it will limit your travel expenses for uh, that particular visit or issue, but. The education group is located in Raleigh. And so depending on what retainer option uh, this board chooses, that'll be up to the board to determine how those travel expenses are you know, worked out. Okay, so that means you would charge us travel fees from Raleigh to Concord. And then so how often will you be able to participate um, in meetings for this board? We meet twice a month, sometimes three times a month. Well, the expectation would be I would be here for every board meeting okay the other question I had was for I can't remember your name yes you talked about training um, extensively for everyone there's over several thousand employees here so how does that how does that work what does that look like um, I, so I can give you the example just continuing on my title nine um, example of how we handle that because everybody everybody in your school district um, you know from custodian up to the board needs to be trained um, so for your school-based people we have a 50 for and this is for title nine but we can do this for other areas we have a 15 minute pre-recorded training which can or cannot have uh, a question answer section at, section at the end to confirm understanding and attentiveness um, and we can give that to you for everybody to watch part of your um, beginning of the year orientation um, or any new employees that are onboarded throughout the year can watch that um, and then beyond that we do specialized trainings for example again for title IX, one of the, the trainings that I think is most important is school-based administrators every district that we represent they ask for title IX trainings and I said I would be doing you a disservice if we don't train your school-based administrators. That is the breaking point for Title IX. Um, so I encourage that, and we'll do that at, say, your um, your your principal's meeting, your AP's meeting. Um, we can do that across the board for whatever areas you need training in. We can give you those really broad ones electronically that you can kind of just feed out where people just need basic information, and then the more specialized ones depending on the level of employee. Mm -hmm. And so there may be some um, some cases that are current with our previous attorneys. How do you guys pick up where someone left off? I just wanted to mention one other thing. Last week I did a customized board training. It included Robert's Rules of Order. It included board policy. It included governmental immunity and how to navigate that in litigation. And then also the, the third part of that was exceptional children and informing the board about how the process works so they become familiar and as repeat your question I'm sorry I, I wanted to about the training I guess I'm just trying to envision I know we can put an all staff and do all staff training but I'm trying to envision if that's something in addition to what we already expect of staff which you know staff got a lot of stuff they got to do right so I'm trying to see what that looks like in relation to what staff are already doing and already have enough on their plate that's the reason why I asked about training so you all would be the drivers of that um, as much training as you want and as much training as you want to have for your administrators um, my experience with educators and boards is that they want as much training as they can get within reason to do their day jobs and it's a balancing act it, but it's board driven hmm. and my second question was about picking up where another firm left off like what does that look like for you what what happens in that process so um, in one experience that I've uh, recently uh, been a part of we had the transition team meet with the outgoing attorneys and the incoming attorneys sat down and talked about specifics of cases and the posture and where they were and then there, the board defined uh, a date certain by which that 
firm was to be done with work and at that point it was Pointer Spruill's responsibility to make sure the work got done. And it, and it really has worked um, extremely well. It's been um, efficient and obviously a lot of things that we do are electronic and it made it very smooth instead of a bunch of boxes. <laughs> okay, last question. Um, in your opinion, who's your customer here? So my client is the Board of Education and that is the body that I have an ethical duty to serve. Thank you. So I guess it's my turn. Okay, uh, a couple things. So you guys already work with Kannapolis, correct? So facilities, transportation, we're all kind of one group. So have y'all already had dealings with us? Have y'all worked with Cabarrus County already? In, in, in what ways? So I, the county, the government, or county as in Cabarrus County Schools? Schools. I, uh, at a previous firm, I worked uh, extensively with your athletics department. Um, I worked uh, with Brian Tyson to address athletic needs as they came forward and did work uh, for them, you know, as needed. And Brian, uh, as the as the athletic director, uh, was seemingly very pleased with my work as I when I served in that role. Okay. So with you guys, I'm sorry, go ahead. You was going to say something. I had the benefit of working with the policy committee and basically was part of the video conferencing um, to make it cost effective but also thorough. And yeah, I worked a lot with your public records, subpoenas, and a couple mm -hmm. people that I see back here in the room that I was really happy to see earlier today. Good. That's good. Uh, one, one more question for you. So y'all being a large education firm, and I like, is really great that you got teachers ex -te former teachers but what what attracts you guys to Cabarrus County Schools besides the four hundred and some thousand dollars <laughs> it's it's not uh, the four hundred seven thousand dollars it's the opportunity to work with the exceptional caliber of employees that we've had the opportunity to work with in the past I will tell you your people are better um, than a lot of folks we've had the opportunity to work with and we would love the opportunity to work with them again. Um, they are hardworking, they're dedicated, and they show up for children. And that's why. Mr. Walter. Yeah, thank you again for coming today and obviously a lot of experience with your firm. Um, can you explain again how you see your role as the board attorney during our board meetings? So uh, generally speaking, for the board attorney during board meetings, um, uh, I will act as counsel during those public meetings. If there's a legal question or a legal issue that presents itself, let's say um, in the event there's a parliamentary issue, for some reason someone forgets that um, there's a second needed for a motion, or for some reason I will politely sort of remind, you know, hi, you, there's a second before we need to go to discussion, very politely. Um, but. Uh, generally speaking, my job is to provide you counsel, and sometimes that counsel will come in the form of a comment, um, and I'll just simply just raise my hand, just like everybody else, and say, hi, uh, there's a potential legal issue here, I'm going to identify it, and then if you want to hear further from me, please do so. If you want my advice, we may have to go into closed session, depending on what the issue is, frankly speaking. Um, but, you know, my role during a board meeting is to advise and counsel, and once we're in closed session, uh, my advice that would then otherwise not be protected by attorney-client privilege can then be protected in closed session where I can speak candidly about pros, cons, advantages, disadvantages in such a way that um, if someone were to ever ask me about that communication, I could simply raise my privilege and say, no, I can't share that information with you. That's attorney-client privilege. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, big thing that we're involved in is construction of schools uh, a lot of contracts and trying to get schools done on time and within costs can you explain how your firm's got some experience in those areas I have two clients with 178 million dollar bonds that they're working on right now I am reviewing uh, or actually just finished up negotiations with 
uh, two contractors and you know for new elementary schools and high schools um, so I will tell you that in addition to our construction group what I do is I do the owner side negotiation for construction of schools um, and renovation projects and so my method uh, frankly is I give you my contract up front it's part of the RFQ or the RFP and then we're not working from your form we're working from mine when we go into contract so negotiation. not using the AIA form uh, it, it could be AIA it could be you know depending on the, the client and what their desires are um, but I my, my idea is when the client puts out the RFP or the RFQ there's a proposed contract attached so nobody's coming in i.e. a bidder is not coming in whether it's an architect or a contractor blind as to what my expectations are into the contract negotiations that way they know up front thank you mm -hmm. um this last question what are you, what are you, what's your opinion on the leandro and where that stands <laughs> um personally um and I, this answer will not be representative of the education law group, so please, this is Brandon McPherson's opinion. Uh, my opinion is it's an inherently political question, and it should have been treated as such back in 1990s. Um, to, to argue anything else seemingly is going contra to the other half of the United States who saw this very same issue and saw it as an inherent political question. We just happen to not be one of those states. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for coming to present to us tonight. Um, so, uh, Robert's Rules. How familiar are you with Robert's Rules and uh, being able to kind of guide us through that during a, a board meeting? So, uh, under your board policy, you have a slightly modified version of Robert's Rules. And so, uh, within your board policy and in addition to Robert's Rules, I, I am fairly certain we will have to learn one another for a little bit to make sure that I understand that what level of, of following of Robert's rules we're going to be doing based on that policy. But I'm very cognizant because I sit with boards of education constantly and we rule on motions and, you know, recesses and all the wonderful things that boards do. And one of my jobs is to help serve as a parliamentarian in case somebody, you know, makes a mistake or some sort, wants to table something that's not appropriately timed for it to be tabled. Um, but yeah, that's part of my job. Okay, um, so I'm going to ask the uh, elephant in the room question. Mm -hmm. um, how many of your attorneys came from Schwartz and Shaw? All of them except for one. So when we are dealing with anything with this law firm, chances are we are probably going to be using one of the attorneys that we dealt with previously in the past with Schwartz and Shaw. Probably with the exception of two that are in the section that one was hired after we arrived at Pointer Sproul and the other who has been at Pointer Sproul for since he left governmental service and was never with Schwartz and Shaw. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I yes. appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Escobar. Thank you so much for traveling and being here with us tonight. I appreciate it. Um, let's start with the parliamentarian thing. So mm -hmm. sometimes in closed session, I'm guilty of this. I don't know what we're supposed to talk about and what we're not. Okay. So let's say I make a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do with me? Uh, I don't. I don't necessarily. <laughs> I don't necessarily do anything. My my job is to I identify the issue. You know, if the board is getting off track and mentioning something that's either not closed session or not appropriately noticed, I'll simply say, "Hi, I do not believe that." topic is, a, is appropriate because it's not closed session or hi that topic is <coughs> not appropriate because it is in, you know it's not identified in your closed session motion and if we want to have a candid conversation with the board about how it either is or isn't that's great but I identify the issue I don't make decisions about whether or not to stop conversation or stop conversation my job is to advise you let me tell you like there are plenty of times that when when you identify an issue a board may say yes we hear you we are going to continue talking about it and then at that point in time I have to make a decision to make about how strenuously I want to make my objection um, we ha I'm very concerned about how our staff 
will um, work with you, I want to make sure that they're happy too because mm -hmm. I recognize the fact that most of this is going to funnel through them. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about your availability. You mentioned it during your presentation, but you know, realistically, there's a lot of things that happen after school hours, mm -hmm. um, and the school superintendent or a member of his staff uh, will need you. Um, how, do, how are we getting in contact with you? And if you're not available, you know, you go on vacation, you might have a life sure. outside of this. <laughs> what, who, who are we talking to? How do we, how do we get what we need when we need it? Well, I will tell you, the district has access to the entire education law team, and they will continue to have access whenever I step away for some reason. If I'm in another board meeting, if for some reason I can't step out and accept the superintendent's phone call or the board chair's phone call, I am literally texting someone else to say, please call X. And that happens sometimes. And the responsiveness has never been an issue and it's never been a question, frankly, for our firm or for our team. When I work with clients, I let them know when I'm not going to be available for a period of time, like I'm getting dental work or I'm going to pick up my child to do some kind of rowing activity. I make, I manage expectations and I'm clear about it. And if something comes up, I tell them, call Brandon or call Rebecca for that period of time if you need coverage. And then I hop right back in and I wear the issue and anyway, what, what Brandon said. I just want to say that um, the, the thing about our group that's so special, and you mentioned the move from one firm to the other, and the reason why this group came together is because we wanted to practice law a new way. We all are friends. We care about each other. We care about each other's clients. We care about each other's you know practice areas. And there is no um, barrier between any of us. We communicate constantly. Um, we know what's going on with each other constantly, with each other's clients. We're working with each other's clients. Even if Brandon is your relationship attorney, the rest of us know what's going on in Cabarrus County Schools. And we might have a special relationship, say your Title IX coordinator might be my person, um, and, and we have that special relationship. But we take care of each other in the firm, and that means taking care of each other's clients. So it's not like Brandon's, you know, having surgery, hopefully not, but having surgery and you're without any resources. Um, we, we make sure everyone is taken care of um, at all times. Okay, and I'm going to read a staff question. As the attorney supporting EC, you will be notified immediately by the EC director or superintendent when a petition for a contested case hearing is received. Describe the level of support you will provide to support the district with next steps, including your approach to collecting information from the district and your approach to mediation, settlement, and preparation for a potential trial. It's a wonderful question and I appreciate the opportunity to answer it. We have four folks, uh, attorneys, who work specifically with EC um, and that type of uh, law, that area. When we work with our clients, we can anticipate when an attorney needs to be in an IEP meeting when another uh, parent is represented by counsel. Um, we have our antenna raised when there's a records request, student records request, because it seems that for a student who's been identified, that is the next step will be litigation. When litigation is actually filed in the Office of Administrative Hearings, our team stops, drops, and rolls in order to do a 10-day letter response. We do that for every one of our cases so that we, as the district and the board, are heard because the timelines are fast and furious, and we don't want to wait a minute. The minute that a petition is filed, the board is notified, but we get to work. We think that if you get to court, everybody's lost. Something. And we work very hard to not put anyone in that position and to serve the child as the federal law requires. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, in our packet of information, there's a proposed approach. And number five, it's um, a amount of money that's paid monthly that includes everything. So it says no hour, hourly rate charges. Does that include mileage and yes, time? That's everything. 
Okay, so that one charge would cover every single thing we need to do and you would not bill us any hourly charges. That's right. Okay. Um, the other thing is, are your costs negotiable? Are there any? We are, we are open to a conversation. Okay. And uh, we have a agenda item every meeting that's for attorney comments. So if you were to come tonight, what would be a hot topic that you'd want to tell us about that's going on legally with education? I'm going to tell you, I have this at two of my other clients that I attend board meetings at regularly, and I enjoy that time because it does allow me to highlight. I will tell you that the, the one I would personally bring up right now is uh, the charter school omnibus bill, which this board has already voted um, its opposition to. It is seeming to have grown legs. Uh, the other thing I would bring up tonight, and I'm going to let my two colleagues also answer, uh, would be um, the uh, opportunity scholarship uncapping uh, bill that's been raised, because I do think you need to be aware of that and the potential impact that that could have on the school district's funding. So those are the two that I would talk about. But they would both be North Carolina specific because the General Assembly, once again, is in session. And as they're making law, you need to be aware of it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? OK. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you, it. Is there any other discussion? Uh, we can move to 4.03, which is uh, discussion. Any further discussion about anything that we've gone over? Did you want these questions answered by this by the firms? Start yes. As the board. I mean. Yes, Christy, could you send out the questions and to both firms and let them answer those for the staff? How long have we given them to do that? A week. I can get those back to you by the end of the week. We'll reach out to the firms, have the questions answered, and uh, I'll get them to the board by the end of the week. That shouldn't be a problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further discussion, then we'll move to 5.01, and this will be for the meeting adjournment. I need a motion to adjourn this special call meeting for April 24, 2023. So move. <laughs> Second. <laughs> I have a motion by Ms. Sandage. Way to go, Keisha. <laughs> and a second by Ms. Lindsay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, hearing none, our session is over. Thank you to everyone that came and the presentations.